you're with us for the first time today, we hope that uh, you will be the last time and you'll come back and be a part of our activities here at this wonderful place. Please find the welcome book that's in your view and uh, pass it, fill it out, and pass it on to your neighbor. And when everybody has filled it out, pass it back to the end of the view where you found it. Let's remember that guided by the Holy Spirit, the purpose of First Congregation of the United Church of Christ in Elgin is to see God's truth, practice Christ's teachings, and love others unconditionally. God is still speaking. Are you listening?
Please be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come up and sit over here on the floor, please. Your friendship when he's lonely, and 
hear laughter when he's happy? If so, say, we will with the help of God. You did a wonderful job. Evan, can you come here? Yeah, these are all your friends. Isn't that fun? They have so many friends. It's a special day for you. Yes, and now we're going to baptize him. You can scoot a little closer if you want to be able to see. But first, I'm going to ask the congregation some questions, too. Do all of you who are witnessing this sacrament of baptism covenant with these parents to love and to care for the one about to be baptized as he lives and grows among us? If so, say, nice and loud, we will. We will. Do you promise to offer the nurture of the church that he may learn to know God and love God and join us on this pilgrimage of faith? If so, say, we will with God's help. We will with God's help. Let us pray. Loving God, with joy and wonder, we bring to you this little one, confident that you will welcome him as your own true child through the mystery of the water and the word. As you enfold him in your arms of love and grace, you make him our brother in Christ. Help him to grow strong and secure here in this fellowship. And by your Holy Spirit, help us nourish his faith, challenge his mind, and inspire him to serve you with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now I invite the Godparents to pour the water of baptism. Would you like to take the pitcher here and just pour the water in? We can make it splash and <laughs> let us know it's water.
first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 7 and 15. I don't have my silk paper here, so look it up if you need to. <laughs> the Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen these peoples, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. Ah, uh, now you, I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he had planned to bring upon his people.
many years ago, before recording devices were standard equipment in everybody's home, I don't know, you remember when you actually had to sit down at a certain time and watch a TV show? Anyway, one night I turned on the television and sat down at the appointed time to watch an episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus. And of course, within seconds, I was cackling with laughter. My wife at the time was seated on the chair at the other side of the room, watching the show with a stone face. She was not a Python fan, needless to say. She was one of those people who wanted the jokes in the show to make sense. And since most of them didn't make sense, she didn't think the show was funny. Well, about halfway through the show, she got up and walked across the room and sat near me on the sofa. And within seconds, she was hooting with laughter. And I said, no, wait a minute. Over there, you didn't even crack a smile, but you come and sit over here, and now you break it up. How come? And she said, it's funny you're over here. <laughs> <laughs> the change in location sometimes makes a difference in how you experience a particular event. A change in perspective can sometimes alter your feelings and beliefs about an issue. After the verdict in the infamous O.J. Simpson trial, a friend of mine who was white was talking to an African American and he said, I don't understand how Simpson got acquitted. He's obviously guilty. And the African American said, so now you know how it feels. And I couldn't help thinking back to my southern upbringing. Of all the cases I knew of Blacks who were convicted on the flimsiest of evidence. And whites, like the men who murdered Emmett Till, who were exonerated when they practically wore their guilt on their sleeves as a badge of honor. Yes, changing your location, looking through somebody else's eyes, can truly be enlightening. And in today's text from Luke 15, it can actually change the meaning of the passage. Jesus tells two stories. He tells two parables. The first one is about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep, and one of them gets lost, and so he goes out looking for the one, and when he finds it, he brings it home and calls all of his friends and neighbors over and says, Rejoice with me, I found the lost sheep. Second parable is about a woman. Notice how inclusive Luke is. He tells a parable about a man, and then a parable about a woman. A woman who has ten silver coins, and one of those coins gets lost, and so she scours the house, and when she finds it, she too throws a party for her friends and neighbors. Now, you and I read these stories 2,000 years removed, with cultural barnacles on our eyes, no less, and we immediately jump to pastoral images of Jesus with a lamb draped over his shoulders, and we say, oh, how sweet. <clears throat> Move to a different location. Stand among that group of scribes and Pharisees listening to Jesus that day. You see, this parable was addressed primarily to them. They had seen the tax collectors and sinners, in other words, the folks, the scribes and the Pharisees, looked down upon. They had seen the tax collectors and sinners welcomed by Jesus, not just tolerated by Jesus, mind you, welcomed by them. Jesus actually ate with those people, and nothing signifies acceptance more than sharing a meal with somebody. The scribes and Pharisees were offended. Jesus seemed to be openly condoning immoral behavior and antisocial practices and with people whose character was questionable at best, reprehensible at worst. So Jesus begins, which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one, and right off the bat, the scribe and the Pharisees say, oh, we know where this is going. He's going to go looking for the lost sheep. Any shepherd worth they saw will go looking for the lost sheep. But then Jesus says, and losing one will not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go searching for the one that is lost. Well, hold the phone now, Jesus. Nobody leaves 99 perfectly good sheep that cost a lot of money, by the way, out in the wilderness. You put them safely in a pen or a fold or something. Jesus
Jesus said he left the 99 in the wilderness. And in the wilderness, they're fair game for any predator, for any thief, not to mention any natural disaster. Plus, that word wilderness in the Bible always has a theological connotation of that place where God and God's people are wrestling with something very important. Cataclysmic decisions. That's why in the, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. That's why when Jesus is tempted, he's tempted in the wilderness. It's a theological location as well as a geographic one. Jesus says the shepherd leaves 99 sheep, perfectly good sheep, in the wilderness. Now all of a sudden the ground has shifted beneath the feet of the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus says, which of you would do this? And they all say, not me. Anybody who would not have sense wouldn't do that. And then Jesus ended by saying, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. The scribes and Pharisees considered themselves righteous, all right, but they knew they were not sinless. They knew there were times when they too needed to repent. Jesus closes the second parable thus the same way. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now again, Jesus' hearers knew they were not above repentance. So Jesus has just given his hearers no place to stand in the story, nowhere to locate themselves in the story except with the lost sheep and the lost coin. Which of you is among the 99 in the wilderness? Which of you is among the nine coins left on the woman's kitchen table? None of you. None of you can stand apart from the tax collectors and sinners. None of you can stand apart from the trailer trash or the selfish rich. None of you can stand apart from the homeless or the well-heeled. None of you can stand apart from the parking lot attendant or the greedy Wall Street mogul. We are all the lost sheep. We are all the lost coin. You know, when I was growing up in Sunday school, we used to sing a little song. It went like this. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. For the Father up above is looking down with love. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. So you know that. You're smiling at me. Or else you think I'm beating nuts. <laughs> Probably more B than A. <laughs> and then we go on to sing, Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear, right? And then we say, Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Nothing wrong with that song. It's a great old song. No, we should teach our children and the adults, for that matter, that behavior is important to a Christian. But if being careful with what our little hands do and where our little feet go is the sum total of Christian practice, then we will never be able to see ourselves as the lost sheep or the lost coin. We'll spend all of our time checking out the other 98 lost sheep out there in the wilderness, making sure their hands don't do what they're not supposed to do or their feet don't know where they're supposed to go. I heard about two men who were working on a roof of a factory and they were working around a large chimney and the scaffolding suddenly shifted and both men fell through that chimney 15 feet down to the floor below. Miraculously, they were unhurt. One of the men had his face all black and sooty with soot from the chimney. The other man had instinctively covered his face as he fell so his face was clean. But before they returned to work, the man with the clean face went and washed his face. The man with the dirty face didn't wash his. Because you see, what happened was the man with the clean face looked at his colleague and saw his face was dirty, so he assumed his face was dirty too, so he went and washed. Likewise, the man with the dirty face had looked at his colleague and seen it was clean, and he figured he didn't need to wash his face, so he went on back to work. Each man decided what he needed by looking at the face of another person, and each man came to the wrong conclusion. That's what they do among those 99 sheep out there in the wilderness. That's what happens when Christian faith gets reduced down to keeping your hands clean or your face clean. That's what happens when a relationship with Jesus loses its focus on God's grace. It is precisely that focus. 
focus on grace that ends both of these parables. Jesus says, which of you wouldn't call your neighbors and friends and say, hey, I've got a little sheep. Come on over for a party. Which of you wouldn't say to your friends and neighbors, hey, I found my lost coin. Let's go out and celebrate. And the scribes and Pharisees say, well, none of us would do that. You and I say, well, no, we wouldn't do that either. I mean, it's nice that you found your lost sheep and your lost coin, but Jesus, that's not enough of a reason to stop everything and throw a party. But evidently it is for Jesus. This kind of joy can't be contained. The lost one has been found. If that's not a reason to drop everything and whoop it up, then I don't know what is. Suppose I, I lost my wallet here in the building somewhere, and I combed through this place high and low and finally found it cash and credit cards still in place. And I got up here and said to say, all y'all said, hey, I found the wallet that I lost, and so I ordered a cake, and it's downstairs in the fellowship hall, and I got balloons and streamers decorating the whole place up, and I hired a band so all of us adults can dance, and I hired a clown to entertain the kids. So as soon as church is over, we're going to go down there and just party till the afternoon is gone because I found the wallet. And you'd say, Paris, you got one more screw loose than I thought. <laughs> I mean, sure, it's nice that you found your wallet, but gee whiz, we can't. That's, not, that's a little over the top, isn't it? I mean, I got yard work to do this afternoon. <laughs> this coming Wednesday night, our youth group is not only going to help out with feeding the poor and the homeless and the under, unemployed and the underemployed who, folks who come to our soup kettle. But they're also going to serve them ice cream and they're going to play bingo with them and they're going to give them prizes and they're going to turn Wednesday night soup kettle into a real festive occasion. Now, what would happen if you went to that uncle of yours who says that all poor people are poor because they're just lazy or that sister-in-law you've got who believes that only drunks and crazy folks wind up homeless. Or that neighbor who thinks that anybody who doesn't have enough money just isn't working hard enough. And you said to those, that person, hey, come on down to the church Wednesday night or a youth group and throw a party for the hungry and the homeless and the poor. It's going to be fun. Would they go? I guess is they'd rather stay with the 99 and kingdom of God, the joy of getting found must be shared. The joy of God's grace must be celebrated. But an awful lot of people refuse to go to that party. I'm not going in there. The reach of God's grace offends them. The relentlessness of God's love makes them uncomfortable. I sometimes wonder if maybe the author of Matthew's gospel was not one of those people. Because you see, if you look at the way Matthew tells the story of the lost sheep, he has the shepherd going out in search, and then he says, if he finds it, if he finds the lost sheep, he comes home and rejoices. In other words, Matthew leaves the door open for the search to come to an end, and the sheep is still lost. But Luke says, when he finds it. When he finds the lost sheep, not if, when. And he says about the woman, she will search the house until she finds the lost coin. In Luke, the search never ends. The shepherd never gives up. The woman never gives up. The shepherd and the sheep will keep working and looking and persevering until the lost sheep is safely home. The lost coin is finally found. And Jesus says, which of you will keep looking for the lost sheep, never giving up till you find it? And most of us say, well, there's a limit. God says, no, there's not. No, there's not. There's no, there are no ifs in God's grace. There are no boundaries to God's grace. There's no good enough in God's grace. Most of you probably remember a few summers ago when the youth were on their way to the, right, to the mission trip. Two of our youth got accidentally left behind at a train station. On their way, and all of a sudden they realized there was two of them left behind. Now, suppose Lois had come back from that week and said, Well, we came home with all but two of our kids. That's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's not good enough. Lois did everything possible to reunite those kids with the group, and she got it done. Why do we think God would do any less?
God's love is relentless. God's love never gives up. You and I might give up, but God never gives up. You and I might think the universe has got to balance out between grace and self-reliance, but God doesn't think so. You and I may think love has limits, but God doesn't think so. Charles Poole once said, most of us fear we will go too far with grace. And the truth is, never gone far enough. Most of us fear we will go too far with grace. The truth is we've never gone far enough. God's love is relentless. Which of you will be relentless in your love? at our 
our disposal, and yet this child is resting in your arms, not ours? How did this happen? The great God of heaven will look down on your face and say to those demonic forces, you to ponder the words of the sermon, but I wanted to remind our senior high youth that um, their Sunday school class begins um, as the next hymn starts to play, so they should leave for their high school Sunday school class. Let us pray together, and then I invite you to pray silently. Oh, great God, thank you for being a God who looks for us until we're found. A God who loves each one of us unconditionally and whose, whose love will just not let us go. Let us live our lives as disciples who walk closely, so closely, that we can hear your voice guiding our journey. In Jesus' name.
Um, had uh, several people that um, lost loved ones this week. Connie Reuter's mother passed away this week. Um, Bill Becker's sister passed away quite suddenly, quite unexpectedly this week. Um, and then uh, a friend of mine back in Georgia has uh, a friend that he's worked with by the name of uh, Casey Eubanks. Uh, he and his wife uh, had a, uh, their, their little son, three-month-old son, Michael, who died from SIDS. Derek asks, I was asking for prayers, and I told him that I would give them to you uh, this morning. Also, uh, Mari Munch had uh, cataract surgery this week, but had complications from it. Uh, he's resting today and goes back tomorrow to see if uh, his vision uh, has returned. So we want to pray for Mari uh, these days. And uh, then I think it would be appropriate for us to uh, thank God for Evan's baptism today uh, and the joy that uh, he is to his family. So choir, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's sing together as we prepare. Lord, 
for those things that give a lightness to our step and a smile to our faces. And now we dare once more to pray the words Jesus taught us to pray and continues to teach us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
par with grace. That's what that 99 crowd in the wilderness is worried about. Because the truth is, you've never gone far enough with God's grace. And may that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, along with the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever.